This is from VTX Rudy. And they said, Christy, what kind of line do you use and why test pounds? And so I said. Why test pounds? Or what it's, test? It says why. Maybe they meant what. Okay. I really don't know. But I said, I like the kind that doesn't tangle. And I think it's called mono. And I'm pretty sure that you test pounds to make sure it won't break when you set the hook and you fight the fish into the kayak. How do you test pounds? Pull on it to make sure if you've got you a You have fish. like a calibrated elbow that's going to no, tell you? you can do that weight thing where you... That's drag. Uh, you know, like when you pull the fish... Oh, because you say that you can pull it out by hand and that's your drag. Yeah. The, the, you turn this little thing the on The pound test, not the test pound. The pound test is what the line tests out at and for breaking it strength. Break. It, that's the breaking strength. Most lines underrated. It'll break actually a little past what it says. A cheaper line generally is going to break So you know, if it's a 10-pound line, you can't get bigger than a 10-pound fish? You can. That's all about leverage. You're not actually pulling the entire weight of the fish. It's not like you're picking it up in the air. You're just fighting them. Plus, you're using drag and leverage. So, to answer the question, what was the question? <laughs> what kind of line do I use and why do you test the pounds? Okay, so I'm going to fix your question for you. The, the pound test is to determine the breaking strength. Um, and, and generally, yeah, right. generally, what you're looking for. Uh, it is more about what you're gonna what how much pressure you're gonna put on it on the hook set more so than the weight of the fish so if you have a, a thick drag you know if you have a strong drag and you're fishing thick mats and you're flipping and pitching and things like that you're gonna have a really you're gonna have a really 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 tight drag and you're gonna have a higher pound test some people flip with 50 60 you know even 80 pound braid uh, and sometimes they tie in leaders, sometimes they don't. That's a punching setup. Uh, I, for the most part, never get above 50. Uh, I use 50 for punching sometimes. I use 30 for punching sometimes in heavy weights. But by and large, uh, I like to use, you know, 20 or 30 pound braid for 90% of my applications. I do use, you know, 50 for throwing uh, big frogs in, in, uh, in, um, big flats pads i like to have that frog on a rope so i can drag them out of there um, but the pound test is basically the breaking strength of the line and you really want to have um, what you're going to set and but it's a combination of the hook set and the drag sometimes you're going to set the hook just to get the hook buried depending on the type of lure that you're using but you're not necessarily going to have a stiff drag so as you set the hook some line's going to peel off so you're going to give up some of that the pressure on the knot um, you know, a lot of people worry about the pound test or the test, that, you know, the pound rating of the line more so than they do about the, um, the knot. And so I think, uh, if you're using 10 pound test with a really good knot, it's better than using 20 pound test with a crappy knot. By and large, your failure point is your knot. And so what I would say is you're almost better and, and I know a lot of other YouTubers out there and, and some, you know, fishermen are going to go, what did he just say when I said, I'm almost of the mindset of underlining versus overlining, but that's because I like to underline it because I like to create a challenge for myself. Uh, if you are still learning, if you're practicing, if you're fishing a tournament, overline it, you know, go up a little bit. If there's a debate, air towards the heavier line. I kind of like to give myself a challenge. I use as light a line as I can get away with. And uh, for me, for about 60%, 70%, so the vast majority of my presentations, I'm using 20 or 30 pound braid, and I'm using somewhere between 12 and 17 pound fluorocarbon or, or monofilament leader. And I almost never use mono. In fact, <laughs> I probably haven't tied on straight mono on a rock since I started kayak fishing, to be honest with you. And this is not an indictment on the folks out there that use mono, and it's not an indictment on even some of the pros out there that tout using mono. Here's why I use mon I don't use mono, and they maybe do. Uh, they're fishing from a bass boat, and so they can set the hook and do the two or three step backup. If, you're, if you, you know you've seen that. You can't do that in a kayak. Not to mention, when, let's, this is my kayak and this is the fish. When you set the hook in a kayak, the it actually pulls the kayak towards the fish and it pulls the fish towards the kayak. That doesn't happen in a bass boat. When you're in a bass boat, you never set the hook and it pulls the boat towards the fish. So you can get away 
and take up a little bit of that stretch from the mono. When you've got the fish moving, the kayak moving, and the mono stretching, it's a recipe for a lot of frustration, a lot of, I call it the hook set all. It's the hook, oh, hook, oh, oh, oh. So to get rid of the hook set all, make sure if you're fishing a kayak that you fish almost exclusively braid. Uh, tie in a, a fluorocarbon leader or even fish fluorocarbon uh, because it has a lot less stretch than monofilament uh, as your main running line. So I know you've heard monofilament and you probably latched on to that word because you hear mono a lot. I don't fish mono uh, with the exception of, I use mono for leaders for frog because it's buoyant, it floats. So when I have a frog on top, the line doesn't sink down and pull the frog underneath the pads or into the vegetation. Other than that, I'm using fluorocarbon leader because it helps sink the lure. Uh, it's a little clearer, it's a lot less visible in water unless you put scent or oil on it, even your oil off your hands and face, which we'll talk about later. Uh, but fluorocarbon's usually a lot less visible in water. Uh, it has less stretch, uh, more abrasion resistance, and it ties a little bit better knots across the spectrum. In heavy test, I think that fluorocarbon ties a better knot. In lower pound tests, I think that monofilament ties, I mean, a uh, fluorocarbon ties a better knot. So there's these intersecting points of just kind of knowing what you should use and when you should use it. So it's a great question, um, understanding what that pound test means. But what you have to remember is it's a, it's, a, it's a factor of the type of lure that you're using, the type of cover that you're fishing, what type of hook set that you're gonna use, the craft that you're fishing from, and how tight a drag. And the drag generally depends on the type of fishing. If you're fishing vertical, you know, like when you're drop shotting or something like that, you can set the drag tight because you're just reeling the fish vertical. And if it runs off to the side, he's got a lot of line in that cone angle, you know, to swim around on. If you're fishing horizontal and you set the hook and you've got to drag the fish out of there, you don't have a lot of room. So you want your drag to be able to pull when that fish makes a bulldog towards cover. Um, so keep those things in mind when you're selecting the pound test, not the test pound. Of line that you're using and uh, we'll do another video where we actually break out some of the different lines talk about the knot tying characteristics we'll call it selecting the proper line uh, it's gonna be a bit but once we get that done if you're watching this video later uh, it'll be linked up in the description box below um, and if you're coming across this video or some of my other videos and I refer to a video that we're gonna do later you can always head over to the side of the screen click on the playlist and there's playlists for more of the miles between more questions for Christy, tips, tactics, and techniques, and then there's also some how-to stuff. So, funny videos, all that good stuff. So, head over to the playlist on the side. Make sure you smash that subscribe button. Uh, give us a big thumbs up, like, and um, comment on the video. As always, this is Questions for Christy on the Miles Between. What else you got? I don't know. I just feel like every single thing, there's so many things to know. And you thought fishing was easy, didn't you? Well, I mean, you know, my papa used to go on the bank and put a worm on a hook and catch some fish. Mm-hmm. That's, that's a different deal. What was the other part of the question? Uh, what's a good time to start fishing? And I said, um, you want to always start early in the morning or later in the evening in the summer. And I'm not sure about the rest of the time of year. But I also told him that they have those apps and even watches that tells about the feeding times for animals, for herd animals, and that bass are herd animals. And so whoa, I know that he whoa, can... Whoa, 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 whoa. So bass are not herd animals. So you me, look at the feeding me, time every time we go fishing. Right, but the bass are actually the predators. So if you think of herding animals, you think of gazelles and you think of uh, antelope and you think of deer and you think of those are prey to the predatory animals. So in this scenario, in, like the, us in, the, deer. in the fishing scenario, the herding animal is the schooling animal. And the schooling animal is the bait fish. The bait fish is the, the is the schooling animal in this case. Now, small bass do school, but I think that for the most part, when you're looking at your feeding times, your solar times, the bass are reacting to the activity level of the bait. And therefore, that's the thing that starts moving or the herding animal, the schooling animal that is affected by the solar charts. And the bass are more the predator that is staging they're like them. They're the hunter. They're the, they're the predator. They're staging themselves yeah. in, the, in the areas for ambush. That and so... Sense when you watch your feeding times and you watch your your so lunar data like i'm a big fan of so i tell everybody go fishing when you when you could if you can't go fishing when you should but you should go fishing in almost all low light conditions 
early in the morning and late in the evening uh, and you should always go fishing uh, during your peak feeding times get out there about an hour ahead of time work your way in learn the area now if you've got a paddle an hour and the peak feeding time is you know two o'clock you want to launch about uh, 12 31 so you can get there at the right time and so your transit time needs to be factored into that but for the most part bass are not the herding animals the schooling animal is the or herding animal in this case because bass don't, or bait fish don't herd they school uh is the is the bait and so when they start moving that's like the conveyor belt for the food and the bigger animals put themselves in position to ambush them and so you were close well, it's just that the, the bass is the pr the predator not the prey well at the end i said if you fish at those times you'll catch some fish you will catch more fish if you fish well actually here's how it works during the off-peak times you fish slow and methodical and tight to cover during peak periods you fish more open water power fishing presentations but you really can catch a lot of fish both times because bass are opportunistic feeders we'll talk more about that when we do an in-depth look at solo lunar feeding times and what i call the swat principle that stands for solo lunar seasonal weather astrological and then temperature as a trend that's the tactical approach to fishing, but we'll talk more about that later. So much. Anyway, guys, thanks for watching this episode of The Miles Between. We just pulled up to Joe's house. We got to do a little KBF business. And uh, then I'm getting on the road, heading down to ICAST 2016. Uh, comment below. Tell me if there's something you want to see me cover at ICAST. And as always, smash that thumbs up button. Please subscribe. And thanks for all your support. And hope you're enjoying still Questions with Christy on The Miles Between.